Kozlovsky. And he's gonna talk about exponential frames and re spaces. Alex, please. Thank you. So I, I, first I want to say that it's really a great idea to organize such a large comprehensive program. And it's a pleasure to participate. Thanks. So my subject is exponential frames and free spaces. And this talk is based on joint works with Gadi Kozma, Shahov Itzan, and Alexander Ulanovsky. So basically the subject is in general, you have a Hilbert space, separable Hilbert space, and you want, you are interested in system of vectors in this space, which have good approximation or representation properties. In, in this, for us, the Hilbert space would be L2 on some set S on the line. The set sometimes more mostly is bounded, but sometimes it's unbounded, but always a finite measure. It's clear why, because we want that exponentials would be elements of the space. So the system of vectors, which I denote E capital of lambda, is the set of exponentials with frequencies in lambda. Certainly, orthogonal, orthogonal orthonormal bases are the best. But, however, such a basis not always can be found, even in this specific case, L2 and S. Everybody knows that if S is an interval, then the classical Fourier basis is indeed a basis, orthonormal basis in the L2 and 0, 1. But even if you take the set S as a union of two intervals, like for example, what is written here on the slide, the orthogonal exponential basis does not exist. And that means that we need a generalization of a concept of orthogonality or the concept of orthogonal system, which on one side keeps the nice properties of orthogonal basis. And on the other hand, which are more available for constructions. And the first concept in this, um, well, this type is Ries basis. Let me remind you the definition. A system of vectors, U lambda, is a Ries basis in the Hilbert space H. If it is an image of an orthonormal basis, under a linear isomorphism of the space. In other, word, in other words, you take an autonormal basis and apply some bounded linear invertible operator. And what, what you get, it is a risk basis. Equivalent definition is the system U lambda is a risk basis if first it is complete in the Hilbert space age. And second, there are positive constants, A and B, such that for any finite linear combination, uh, the two sides inequality, one is true. 
So you can estimate norm of any linear combination by L2 norm of coefficients. You can easily see that such a system is also a basis in Schauder sense, which means that every vector in the space can be represented by a series over the system. And this representation is unique. Uh, by the way, this natural question, whether vice versa is true. If you have non childer basis in H, is it always a Reef's basis? It's not an easy question. It was solved many years ago. The negative answer is due to Konstantin Babenko. What's interesting is that his example, counterexample, is based on exponential system with integer frequencies, but not in standard L2, in L2 with respect to some weight. Should be noticed that Babenka weight uh, belongs to an important class of weights discovered by Benjamin Mackenhaupt in 1972. And let me mention that, that this class of weights was independently discovered by Moscow student Alexander Kranzberg exactly the same time. He was, he solved the following problem to characterize weights for which the classical Haar system is a shoulder base. And he come independently the same to the same class of weights. His paper was published in Russian and unfortunately was not translated. That time translates was not so often. And by this reason, probably uh, his result remained unnoticed by the Western experts in spite of the fact that I uh, referred to his paper a couple of years later in 1975 in my monograph in Fourier analysis published by Springer, so in English. Okay, now let's come back to exponential risk basis. Let me um, formulate two important results in the subject. First is the Landau, Landau density theory. It answers the following question. How many exponentials one needs to get a Ries basis in a given, on a given set S in L2 on S? Landau proves the following necessary condition. If E lambda is a risk basis for L2S, then the burning uniform density D of lambda equal to measure of S. Let me remind you that a discrete set lambda has burning uniform density D if the following equality holds, which roughly means that it is really uniformly distributed on each interval A, A plus R, you have number of points which belong to this interval is G times R plus a member of higher order O of R. And this O is uniform with respect to position of the interval with respect to A. Let me mention that this is certainly only necessary condition. It's not sufficient. And it is clear because if you remove from lambda at least some, at, at least one point, then uh, the density will not change. But 
it will not be anymore a basis, his basis. Another important result which I want to, to mention is Pelivinian stability theory, which roughly says that if you have a risk basis on some set and you slightly perturb the frequencies, then it still remain, remain to be a risk basis. More precisely, it's written here on the slide that given S the set and lambda, uh, the set of frequencies, then there exists a number delta, which depends on S and lambda. And such that whenever lambda prime such, uh, is in an infinity on a distance smaller than delta from lambda, then exponentials with these frequencies is also a risk basis on S. In the classical case, when S is an interval zero one, and then uh, lambda is all integers, then delta can be taken one over nine as Bailey Wiener indicated. And this result was improved by Kaditz who found the sharp value one over four quarter. Now, indeed, risk bases are more available for construction than orthonormal bases. And let me remind you of the result of Christian SAP, which proved that if you have the set, if the set S is a union of two intervals, you remember that for two intervals, you in general have no orthonormal exponentials, orthogonal exponential bases. But if you consider risk base, it's always exists for any union of two intervals. Uh, by the way, the key lemma of SAP is the following. If you have an interval of length smaller than one, then you can find uh, a risk basis of exponentials with integer frequencies. Certainly, this integer should be uh, chosen according to the interval. Uh, this is done basically by uh, stability theorem. If the interval is small, you can use the standard result of Ries, uh, Pelli and, uh, of P Pelli and Wiener. But if the interval is close to one, you need more delicate stability theorem, which was done by Avdonin. It was 20, Christian Saip conjectured that this res, his result is, uh, remain, rem, remains to be true for any finite union of intervals. But this conjecture remained open problem. It took 20 years before it was done by Cos Gadi Cosma and Shahab Nitsan. And they proved that indeed they constructed, they proved that there exists uh, exponential risk basis for any finite union of intervals. In the same time, is, it remains unknown during a long time whether the same result is true for arbitrary bounded set. And the solution was obtained just a few weeks ago. We proved in collaboration with Gadi and Shahov that the answer is negative. We can, there is, there exists an open, there is this, there exists this bounded set such that it doesn't admit an exponential risk basis. This set can be done open or closed as you wish, but the structure of the set is non-trivial. If I have time, in the end, I will maybe say a couple of words about our approach to the theory.
Now let me go to another important concept in our subject, namely to frames. This concept was introduced by Duffin and Schaeffer. And the definition is the following. A system of vectors, U lambda, in a Hilbert space H is called a frame. If there are pos pos positive constants A and B, which are called frame bounds, such that for any vector F in our Hilbert space, the inequality holds. So again, you have two sides estimate, but now for the sequence L2 norm of sequence of scalar products of any vector with given vectors you learned. It's interesting to compare the inequality two in the definition of frames with the inequality one, which was in the definition of risk basis. One can prove that the right inequalities are equivalent. It is the same. And this inequality is called Bessel inequality. But the left inequalities are different. They are, in a, se in a sense, are dual. Let me illustrate this duality on our main subject, on exponential systems. The left inequality in two provides the possibility for stable reconstruction of any L2 function on the real line with the spectrum in S. In stroke, in, uh, in reconstruction from its sampling on a given discrete set lambda. By the way, the space of L2 functions with spectrum in given set S, it's important space. It's called paley wiener space with spectrum S. The space equivalent can be defined as follows. You take L2 on your set S and then consider Fourier transform of all elements of this space. And what you get is exactly paley wiener space with spectrum S. And if you have a, the right inequality in the definition of frame is exactly responsible for possibility of such a reconstruction for any element of Paley-Wiener space. On the other hand, if you look on left, the left inequality in the definition of Ries basis, it is responsible for possibility of to interpolate any discrete L2 function on lambda by the element of the Pelivinus space. Again, Landau proved a necessary condition for exponential frames. It was for this basis and now for exponential space. Uh, it looks as follows. Lim inf of number of lambda, which belong to the interval a f a plus r, if you divide it on r, so if you calculate local density, it should be, lim inf should be bigger on equal or equal to measure of s. This is a necessary condition. You can see that it's stricter than it was for frame there, uh, just opposite. The frame condition was stricter because then there it was exactly equality. 
And here the inequality. So that means that if you have more points, density is bigger than measure of S. It's not a contradiction. It doesn't contradict to uh, the property to be afraid. Certainly, if this density is much bigger than measure of S, that means that this frame is not very good. You need it is quite over complete. And this is not very pleasant. We will discuss this in a few minutes. Now, the most important property of frames is that every factor, vector f admits a decomposition in a series with L2 coefficients. In general, this decomposition is not unique. But one can mention some standard decomposition, canonical decomposition. It, this is, it is given by this formula, f equals to sum c of lambda u lambda, where c lambda look like Fourier coefficient, but it's Fourier coefficients not of original function f, but of some other function which is connected with f by a bijective operator g, which is defined in a second equality. This is the operator g. Now the problem is, it's clear that it's, uh, the frame is an important concept, how to construct it. It is easy in the case if your set S is bounded. In this case, you cover your set by an interval and take Fourier basis for this interval. Orthogonal, orthonormal, orthogonal basis for this exponential basis for this interval. And it's quite, quite clear that if it's orthogonal, orthogonal basis for an interval, then it is a frame for any subset of this interval. But again, pay attention, please, that if the diameter of the set is much bigger than the measure, this uh, frame is not very good because it's again it is uh, very over complete but this simple construction is for bounded sets for unbounded sets it was during a long time it was an open problem does a frame, exponential frame, exist for every unbounded set of finite measure? And this was uh, answered only a few years ago. Again, let me comp let me interpret give interpretation in term in terms of recovering of elements of paley wiener space. The point is that if S is a bound set, then the paley wiener space with, of L2 function with spectrum in S, it consists of very good functions. All functions are analytic. They are entire function of exponential time. But if the set is unbounded, then the space is losing the property of analyticity, even smoothness property. Only what you still have is continuity. And intuitively it's quite clear that in this case, the problem of recovering of the function of this space from 
a given discrete sampling became more difficult. Now let me uh, formulate some results we obtained in this subject. The first theorem, it is theorem two, was obtained in collaboration with Alexander Ulanovsky. And this says that whenever you have a set S, now you should think about unbounded because for bounded, everything was known. So if S is unbounded set of finite measure, then there is a set of frequencies, lambda, by the way, with critical density, D of lambda just equal to measure S, such that the system of exponentials with these frequencies is complete in the space L2 on the set S. You can interpret it the following way that the recovering is possible. No. Completeness means that yes. recovering is possible. Yeah. But uh, it is not stable. We cannot get L2 stability, which means that small uh, error in the measurement provides you small errors in the result. A few years later, we proved a st stronger stable sampling theory. It is a joint result with Shachov, Nitsan, and Alexander Lomanovsky. And this says that for every, again, unbounded set S of finite measure, the space L2 on S admits an exponential frame, which provides a stable recovery. I should mention that while, while theorem two was proved by direct construction, the proof of theorem three is based on a deep result by Marcus Spielman and Shrivastava. Let me say a couple of words about the brief proof of theorem three. I will not formulate this deep result of the three authors. I will formulate a lemma, uh, which I, uh, um, which we deduced from this. Actually, before formulation of lemma, let me mention the main ideas which led us to the proof of theorem two theorem three are connected with the following general problem. Let A be orthonormal matrix of large order. Is it possible to find a sub matrix of this matrix, which is almost orthogonal, more precisely, which is well invertible. We can, for, let's formulate the problem in a bit more concrete form. Suppose that in your large orthogonal matrix of order N, you have fixed K columns. K is much smaller than N. Can you find, say, 2K rows of the matrix so that to obtain matrix, sub matrix of sizes 2K times K will be well invertible? This problem appears from many point of view. It was posed by Boris Kashin 
in the theory of orthogonal series. It was considered by John Bourguin and Lord Safriri from point of view of Cadison Zinger problem. And many other authors consider this and they get a deep result. But a crucial progress in the area achieved by the outstanding paper of Marcus Spielman and Srivastava. And here is a lemma which we deduce from this result. So again, let M be a N times K matrix composed by K columns of some orthonormal matrix of order N. Assume that all rows of M have the same norm. We, we have in mind to apply it for exponential Fourier matrix. So this condition is not uh, restrict, it's not a restriction. The lemma says that you can find a family of rows in the matrix such that you have the following two sides inequality. But if you apply the, ma the matrix which you get by given columns and the rows which you find, this matrix I denote by M of J. So for every vector W, the norm square of the norm of this vector can be estimated from below and from above by the norm of the vector itself with certainly with coefficient k over n. And with some constant c small and c capital, which are absolute constant, numerical constants. Let me mention that the proof of this lemma as I told you, it's based on the result of Marcus Spielman and Srivastava. And what we do on, it is done by, we do it by induction. On each step of the induction, we use this important theorem. So we start with all rows of our matrix. On the first step, we, roughly speaking, select half of these rows. And the next step, you from this half, you, roughly speaking, select again a half, and so on. And by this way, you came to the number of rows, which is approximately k, ck. And on each step, uh, it's not automatic using of the result of three authors, because on each step, the constant became worse. And the uh, to look, to control the constant, this is the main point in the proof of lemma one. Now, we use lemma one for the construction of good frames. We say that a frame E of lambda exponent, the frame, exponential frame is good if the magnitude of the frame bounds, these numbers A and B, which is the in the definition of frame, is comparable with the measure of S. This property implies that the density of lambda is also comparable with the measure of S. And in some way, this, this definition of good frame means that your frame is like orthonormal, have some property which is similar 
to property so for the normal basis. Let me illustrate this concept on a simple example. Take the set S, which is, take the interval zero one, divide it on N large number of equal intervals and take one of these intervals, zero, one, N, one over N. We want to get a frame on this set. This is trivial. For example, exponentials with all frequencies is a frame, but certainly this frame is not good because its density is much bigger than the measure of the set. On the other hand, you can take lambda equal to, you can include in your lambda only integers which are multiple of n. And in this, by this way, you get an orthonormal basis on a set S. So it's the best, it's the best possible frame. Now the problem, can one get such a good frame for any set S? This is not trivial even for bounded set. And first we prove it for bounded sets. And we prove it using lemma one. And we give a positive answer. Let me just formulate what we get. For any bounded set, we constructed, when I say we, I mean uh, Shachov Nitsan, Alexander Ulanovsky, and me. We constructed an exponential frame with a frame bound satisfying these conditions. So it is comparable with measure of S. C and C prime are absolute constants. We also extended this result to unbounded sets of finite measure. And this way, we got a proof of theorem three. Now, it seems that I have a bit time so I will give some comments to the proof of theorem one, which, which says that there is a bounded set which does not admit an exponential risk basis. Uh, To characterize our approach, to say a couple of words about our approach, let us consider a version of this problem for weighted A2 space on R. This is a very simple question. And the answer that no, risk basis does not, exponential risk basis does not exist. And you can prove it, the, the proof is the following way. Assume that it does, denoted by E lambda. This is the exponential risk basis in weighted A2 space. Now take a simple function, for example, indicator of the interval zero one. F of T is indicator of interval zero one. And since you have a basis, decompose it in a series with respect to this basis. Remember that if you have a risk basis, then the norm of the function is comparable with L2 norm of the coefficients, comparable with some constant A and B, which are fixed for this, for this basis. Now, and this is the main point, let's consider the translate of this function. This is a translate on H. Then easy calculations, maybe formal, but it can be easily justified. It shows that the composition of this translated function with respect to our basis looks as it's written in the in 
the formula three. So coefficients just multiplied on exponentials of this form. That means that L2 norm of coefficients remains unchanged. So on the other hand, the norm of the function when you get h tending to the infinity, it certainly tends to zero because the weight is integrable function. And this gives you a contradiction. I used this simple argument many years ago. It does not work directly for L2 spaces. L2 space is much more difficult. But there is a way to perform it so that this, um, roughly speaking, this performance is the following. Now you have a set S of finite measure, but this set is not an interval. It is quite a set which has many gaps. And now if you have some take some function on S, on this S we, where you want to construct a least basis, and assuming that you have such a basis, you get an extension of this function, automatic, a unique extension of this function in A2 series on the line. And this extension is also defined in the gaps where function, we, we don't see this function. To only know that using this frame or using this series basis, we can extend it. But how it looks? Now, if you make some uh, translation, then part of the norm can be gone from the set S. On the other hand, you can get some norm from inside, from, a, from outside, from outside, from outside of the set S. And the property of risk basis requires that there is some balance between how much you lose and how much you get from outside. And actually, to analyze this balance, this is the main problem as a proof. And what we prove that we can construct some set S of finite measure. We can construct a function F and a translation H in such a way that this balance is fails. But this balance fails. Okay, I think that I cannot add to this comments, to any comments to this. Hmm? Sorry. Now uh, let me go to the last section of my talk. I would like to mention some open problems in the area. The first problem is to characterize such sets S which do admit an exponential risk base. We are very far from solution of this problem. This problem is open even for orthonormal bases. You know that remarkable Fuglide conjecture indicate some geometric condition on the set for existence of orthonormal basis on this set. But in one dimensional case, this conjecture is still 
open. It is not proved and not disproved. Basically, it's proof for union of two intervals. It was done by Isabella Laba. But I don't know essentially uh, more general results in this case. In higher dimension, there are counterexamples to Foglidi conjecture, which came from, which was given first by uh, Tao. But on the line, the problem is still open, and we do not have characterization of sets which admit orthonormal basis. Second question which I want to mention is the following. So again, theorem one, look at theorem one. It says that on some, for some op, uh, bounded set, exponential risk basis does not exist. On the other, risk basis always exists. Let me notice that risk basis is a minimal frame, which means that it's a risk basis is almost a frame, but it has specific property. That is such a frame that you cannot remove any element. If you remove at least one element, it immediately stops to be a complete system. Okay, but maybe it's possible to construct almost minimal frame. I mean the following question. Given S, can one, can one find a frame such that the density of the set of frequencies lambda equals to measure of S. You see that if it is possible, it certainly will not be a risk basis. It's not possible to get, but it will be close in some sense, close because it is a, you cannot remove too much. It is not over complete. You cannot remove too much because this value is a critical in general. Okay, maybe I will finish by the following question, which is well known. All what I told you today uh, uh, was related in one dimensional situation. Actually, the results, all three results which I formulated remain true in many dimensions, all three theorems. But in two dimensions, there are much simpler set for which it is not known whether they admit exponential risk basis. The simplest set is a disk. And I think it's a very uh, interesting problem whether a risk exponential risk basis does exist in a disk. Okay. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Alex. Indeed, let's thank the speaker. Wonderful talk. If you have any questions or comments, uh, please go ahead. I do not see all the participants. If you have either type it in the chat or go ahead. Uh, 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 Alex, would it be possible to share the PDF file of your talk in the chat? Yes, sure. Why Thank not? You. We appreciate a lot. Okay. If there is no comment or question, let uh, there is one. There is a question uh, by Maud asking, what does well invertible mean? Oh, invertible means that it's a B, B operator, which is 
is a B action, linear operator, bounded linear operator, which is a B action. In this, in our situation, this is a definition. One can understand invertible in a different sense, but here is it, it is understood as a bounded isomorphism of the space. Bounded isomorphism. Okay. I understand that Akram uh, lecture should be soon. So yeah, it's about uh, eight minutes from now. So uh, if there is no further comment or question, let's let's thank Alex again. Okay. And uh, if possible, please share your your file in the. Yes, in yes, yes, yes. How to do this? Just a moment. What I should do? You go to chat. And there is a place on the bottom right. Yes. So I remove the chat. No, you, you go to chat. Yes. There is a place you see a little rectangle over there. And you can click on the rectangle and then share your file. On the, on the bottom right side. No, just a moment, maybe go this way. Okay, I will temporarily just leave. And in this case, definitely it will be disconnected. <laughs>